Uh, my next guest, Amber Athey, she writes for Spectator. You guys also have probably seen her on a lot of TV hits, Fox News, Newsmax. She's everywhere. Amber, thank you so much for joining the show. Thanks for having me. Amber, you point out in your latest piece, when does the media cover a horrific crime? You, you give a few examples here. And you talk about a phenomenon where they're they're starting to care about crimes based off of who the attacker is and what race the attacker is. Can you give us some examples of that? Yeah, that's exactly right. So there were actually three mass shootings that took place within just about two weeks of one another. And only one of them was aggressively covered on cable news. And that was the Atlanta shooting where a white male um, shot eight people across several massage parlors. And some of the victims were Asian. I think it was six out of eight of them were Asian. And this was taken as the latest example of the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes. Um, And this guy was allegedly attacking these people based on their race. Um, The facts in the case that we know so far suggest that's actually not true. The suspect says that his motivation was actually due to a sex addiction and a pornography addiction and that the attack had little to do with the the victim's race. Now, there were two other mass shootings that occurred after this one that uh, did not receive the same coverage from the media. The first was in Boulder, Colorado, where you initially had all of these hot takes from journalists and activists claiming that this was another angry white man committing a mass shooting. As soon as it came out that this guy was a Syrian immigrant, the media dropped the story like a hot potato. And then another story out of uh, of, uh, Virginia Beach where eight people were injured and two were killed in a mass shooting. That didn't get covered at all. And interestingly enough, in that case, the two suspects were black, and this um, mass shooting occurred after some type of fight outside of a bar. So you can clearly see how the media picks and chooses which mass shootings or which horrific crimes they want to cover based on whatever race-based narrative they can push. And the one that they prefer is if there is an angry white person attacking minorities and all the other ones just get ignored. Yeah, and I was talking uh, with someone about this today and I said, you know, it's got to be heartbreaking for the family members of these victims when all of a sudden the person that you lost is not valuable to the media. So their story doesn't matter anymore. And even worse, uh, Amber, which you point out, is the story of the Uber driver in D.C. because when people did you know, talk about this story because the video was so horrific and so graphic. And I do not encourage people to go watch it because it really it it kind of it sticks with you longer than you'd like it to. Um, But when people started talking about this, you mentioned that Yahoo News reporter Hunter Walker had a problem with people talking about the race of these attackers. Can you explain to people what Hunter's issue was? Right. Hunter was actually accusing conservatives of being the ones to politicize race in this case. He said that it was essentially racist for people to mention that it was two black teenage girls who were responsible for this man's death. And when you actually look at what conservatives have been saying in this case, it's that this clearly would have been a major news story across covered across cable, uh, all of these different mainstream outlets that normally would pick up something like this if not for the fact that the suspects in this case were minorities and therefore did not advance this media narrative. So they were actually pointing out hypocrisy among the media. And so Hunter really exposed himself and the media's goals by all of a sudden saying that it was a problem to mention race when he himself, just a couple of months ago, by the way, thanks to some Twitter sleuths, uncovered that he was mentioning the race of people who were storming the Capitol because they were mostly white. So race only matters to him in one circumstance. And if you point out that hypocrisy, all of a sudden you're the one who's racist, not the people who are using this race-based narrative to advance their idea of of, of constant marginalization and oppressor versus oppressed in American society. Yeah. And Amber, one thing I noticed about your piece, which, again, people can find in Spectator, it's when does the media cover a horrific crime? Um, A lot of people have made this argument, but something unique to your piece is that you mention that this seems to be the media advancing anti-whiteness. I I haven't seen anyone really take on that argument yet, but it does make sense because 
like you said, when that mass shooting happened in Boulder, Colorado, there were a lot of hot takes right away that were saying, oh, I'm not surprised. You know, it's a white man. It's always a white man, things like that. So you really do think this is an anti-whiteness situation? Well, you have to look at this in the context of the broader national conversation on race and specifically the advancement of uh, critical race theory, which really does um, tap into the idea that white people have a special set of privileges in this country and they use those privileges to uh, get away with things that minorities would not be able to get away with. And in the the, uh, Boulder, Colorado case, the allegation was that the only reason this man was taken into custody alive after this mass shooting rather than being killed was because the police believed him to be a white man. So even after it was discovered that he was a Syrian immigrant, it was still, well, he got, he had the privilege of being uh, assumed to be white because of his skin color, even though he actually wasn't. So they still actually managed to blame this on white people in a way. And it all boils down again to the idea that white people, just by literally the way they were born, are oppressing others in society um, with their distinct privilege. And that ties back to, again, critical race theory, which is being pushed in schools across the country and even in government training sessions. That's one thing Trump tried to undo during his last couple of months in office. And the media is, is right along for the ride. I'm speaking with Amber Athey from Spectator US. Um, Amber, one thing I noticed, because I follow you on Twitter, and I admire how fearless you are in tackling certain issues. And one issue that I always try to steer clear of is when people play the victim card for any reason. You know, there's some situations where people are victims. And, you know, I I know you don't tackle that as much. But when people are using it as a way to shield themselves from criticism, you oftentimes speak out about that. And there was a situation recently with an intern from USA Today where she got her first headline and then she got some criticism and all of a sudden it was, you know, she can't be criticized because she's a young woman in journalism and your advice was toughen up. That's exactly right. People uh, who are in the journalism profession get criticized all the time, as they should be. We have a lot of power um, in the platform that we're given and in the stories that we're able to cover. And so in her case, she was actually suggesting that people who were involved in the Capitol riot or the January 6th protest should not be allowed to crowd uh, source donations for their legal defense. And so that was necessarily punching down. She's someone with this huge platform on USA Today, regardless of whether or not she's an intern. And she was trying to take away the ability of people who don't have that platform to be able to afford a right to a good legal defense. And so she was, she took heat for that. And, you know, if you can't cut it, then journalism is not going to be the profession for you. And unfortunately, this is a trend on the left that I've written about many times. Very similar thing happened with AOC when she was talking about her response to the storming of the Capitol. And she blamed essentially the various inconsistencies in her story on the fact that she had been a past victim of trauma. So if you actually questioned her retelling of the event, then you were somehow re-traumatizing her. And this victim narrative gets brought up time and time again from people who, again, don't want to face criticism for their actions. They would rather just silence the people who actually have something meaningful to say in response to their stories. And Amber, I remember you wrote a piece criticizing AOC and I was kind of I had you on that day and I was kind of thinking, well, this is this is a little bit bold of Amber to be calling out AOC for this. And then later that day, the story broke that she actually wasn't even in the building. She was in a completely different building. So you were right on about that. But a lot of people didn't want to go near it because, like you said, they'd be accused of being sexist or, you know, kind of cruel. Yeah, and I think, you know, as a a woman, especially when you look at the left identity politics, I find it uh, necessary to speak out when people do things like this, because I know if a if a male colleague had written the same article, he probably would have gotten um, much more aggressive backlash than I did, because the left believes that you can only speak out against certain issues if you've either personally experienced them or if you have some type of immutable characteristic that makes you more likely to understand the issue at hand. So when I see, you know, fellow women using stories like this to try to create a victimhood narrative, I feel like I have to be the one to speak out about it. 
Amber Athey from Spectator US, and you guys can follow her on Twitter. I have one more question for you, Amber, on a lighter note. I saw today that you tweeted about Joe Biden's dogs, and you said there's reports that one of them pooped on the floor of the White House. Is that true? Yes, there is a White House print pool report uh, today where the reporter claimed that as they were going to watch Jill Biden leave the White House, they saw Biden's dogs and there was a poop stain on the floor of the White House and they could not be sure which dog did it, but it definitely did happen. And I have to tell you, this dog story uh, keeps getting weirder and weirder. And it makes me feel bad for them because usually when dogs act out in this way, usually means they're stressed out or they're not getting enough attention from their owners. Yeah, and I I just don't think the White House is the place for them right now. I I remember the media was so excited that these dogs were ushering in this entire, you know, new era of beauty and decency and normalcy and unity. And and really now they're pooping on the rugs and they're biting people and it just doesn't look good. Uh, Amber, where can people follow you on Twitter? They can find me at Amber underscore AC, and they can read my work at spectator.us. Use my discount code Amber for 10% off a subscription. Thank you, Amber. And guys, we will be back on the other side with more of your calls. I I love talking to Amber about the serious stuff, but she also, she she gets a lot of scoopage on the more interesting gossip that's happening at the White House. I, that was the first time I heard about the dog having an accident, relieving himself. And again, we don't know which dog it was, but I'm going to guess that they're going to say Champ because (laughs) Champ can afford to take the fall for this. Major, Major cannot. Guys, have you ever wondered what Omaha State, what makes Omaha Steaks so darn good? It's the aging process. Jared is literally chomping at the bit right now to talk about his steaks. Had the pork chops last night. And uh, the thing came with a little packet of, like, a little bottle of seasoning. Ooh. Their own seasoning, the Oma Steak seasoning on the pork chops. Ah, oh, it was glorious. Pork chops are so underrated. Pork is generally underrated. And it cooks really tender with Omaha. It's, like, it's, it's really flavorful and delicious. Omaha Steaks ages their steaks at least 21 days because that's a sweet spot. It's where the magic happens. You can try the mouth-watering steaks in the Butcher's Best Sellers Grill Pack. It includes four of their iconic and fork-tender Butcher's Cut Filet Mignons, four ultra-juicy burgers, four savory pork chops, which Jared was just talking about, desserts, and so much more. This is a huge cooler full of delicious goods, guys. You are going to get this and be set for quite some time. Go to omahasteaks.com, enter Curly with an E into the search bar for a special price on this Butcher's Best Sellers package. Plus, you'll get four more chicken breasts and four more of those delicious burgers for free. Omaha Steaks has been the leader of gourmet steaks and food since 1917. No one comes close to matching the flavor, tenderness, and value of Omaha Steaks. Go to omahasteaks.com, type keyword curly with an E, C-U-R-L-E-Y in the search bar, and order the Butcher's Best Seller Pack today. Don't forget you'll get the four free chicken breasts and four burgers. That's omahasteaks.com, keyword curly, 844 542 We'll be back on the other side. Don't go anywhere. This is The Grace Curley Show. You're listening to The Grace Curley Show. 